I've always felt connected, more connected with God when, particularly when I'm by water. Um, I think there's just something peaceful, soothing, calming about being by water. Welcome to the Remote No Pressure Podcast. It's great to be back for another episode. How you doing, Bill? I'm doing great. How you doing? That's awesome. It's it's weird. We got some white stuff on the ground finally. Finally, finally yeah. In January. Normally, you know, you're like sledding and stomping around in snow. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be another storm rolling in this weekend, they say. That's what they say. We're going to... Um, have you seen that video? That lady's like, get some pie, get all fat and sassy. You hear that lady? <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh my gosh. I'll have to post that out. That was hilarious. Uh, what did she say? Get some soups, bake some pies, get all fat and sassy. Because it's like a big storm coming in in the south. And then my son, he's five, he goes around and says, I'm just going to get all fat and sassy. He says, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's weird that it's it's like this time of year, and there's not a lot of snow, and, and there's no ice on the lakes down here. And, um, you know, my father-in-law invited us up a couple weeks ago up to uh, Cadillac. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't go. He's leaving at like four in the morning to go ice fishing because that's like the only place in the state those few lakes around that area yeah and he said there were over 80 shanties that is it's crowded too i mean it's not that big of a lake it's a decent sized lake but weren't you telling me about like some snowmobiles and stuff going in the water when i was a kid i used to work in cadillac you know and um you'd always hear about so there's a strange phenomenon up there (laughs) and in northern michigan or in in cadillac in cadillac in specific Uh, okay because there's two lakes in cadillac lake mitchell lake cadillac (laughs) or clam lake i think it's called I don't remember. I, I only lived there like 18 years. It's and called Clam Lake? I think so, because that's where the Clam River comes from, and that runs through my hometown. Okay, okay. So I, I believe... Uh, are there any the clams in the clam? Yeah, where, there are. Like freshwater clams? I believe so, yeah. I don't know. I don't eat clams. I don't know. All right, sorry to interrupt you. Sir. So Go ahead. Uh, I, can't, <laughs> I can't remember which order it is. I want to say first the canal between the two lakes freezes, and then the lakes freeze and the canal thaws. So, But you never have everything frozen at once. Really? Yeah. I, all winter long. Yeah. And I was like in, I, I want to say Guinness Book of World Record or something, something weird, some weird, you know, publishing, you know, years ago because there's a strange phenomenon that only happened here. And, uh, but in the winter time, you have the snowmobilers who want to run the canal. So they want to like try to make it all the way across. Yep. yep. And so they get going on, on that lake as fast as they can. And then they hit that water and they hope to make it <laughs> to like Mitchell or Lake Cadillac. You know, it's just crazy. How, yeah. I wonder how many snowmobiles are at the bottom of that canal. They got to pull them out. They don't. I mean, okay. They're gonna stay in there. Uh, like the how deep is? It? Is it like pretty deep canal or is it not? No, too the bad? canal's pretty shallow. I believe. I, I never swam in uh-huh. the canal when I was a kid. But uh, well, if it if it makes it past the canal, it's gonna get to the deeper part of the lake. But the um, not the coast guard, probably the police. I don't know who's responsible for taking care of it. They always pull everything out of there, like. <laughs> If your truck goes in, they're gonna pull a crane out and they're gonna they're gonna fish that truck out of there so you don't pollute the water and yeah keep yeah. it clean because all that oil, you know yeah and plastic not, and if not they'll find you in the spring they they've found snowmobilers in the spring when they you know the thaw comes and they kind of pop back up to the top. <laughs> cold down there <laughs> <laughs> and you got to register so there's a registration sticker on the snowmobile yeah. so they can yeah. find who the owners and most times they're like so-and-so never showed back up to to camp or uh oh true you know it's not like they go missing for months and nobody knows nobody even knew they were gone it's like right they're gone for four hours and people start reporting it you know you know i remember the first time i stepped on a frozen pond because you know growing up in texas mm-hmm. it's not like a normal thing for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there were like six, probably at least six inches of ice on the water. And, you know, around the bank there, it's a little warmer. So you have to kind of step over, you know, it's not always completely frozen yep. right there. And I'm like, is this safe? And it's six inches of wa- of ice, you know? And I'm like, is this thing safe the whole entire time? I'm paranoid. I'm going to fall in because it's kind of like quicksand when you're a kid, yep. you know, you think, you know, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Kill yeah. Me. And then you think like with ice, like you're going to fall in. Like that's a, because growing up in Texas, you don't, you don't understand it. You know, you only get ice out of the freezer. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so I kept thinking at any moment, I'm going to like fall through this ice mm-hmm. and die. You know, so it took me a long time to just, there's like cracks that go on while you're out there. Even at, you know, like there's movement. And so you'll hear like a crack and oh my gosh, we were fishing um, a nice tournament way up north. Uh, it's called the Dam to Dam tournament up uh, by Nuevo or on Croton Pond. Okay, Croton Pond, and uh, man, some of the 
some of the fish they pull, pulled out of there, like the they looked prehistoric. They were pike, you know. Yeah. And then I'm like, they were so big, and just so mo- they just I I never seen anything like it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That some is the, crazy. Some of the fish in our waters up here are just amazing. It it is amazing. You know, it's, it's like I would like to go back there and catch them on the fly. That'd be mm-hmm. a lot of fun and do that. But yeah, there's a lot of history here though with fishing and there is. And um and I I just want to give a shout out to Ray Schmidt with TFO and just say hey man you're doing a great job with your videos preserving the flies and the history of fly fishing in Michigan because actually Trout Unlimited started here mm-hmm. and we just take it for we take it for granted that we have so much awesome public water that we can go fish anytime yeah. we want and uh but it's cold right now so I, yeah I, not really thinking about that yeah I'm not fishing as yeah. as much as I would want to. Yeah. Uh, but it's been great to see some pictures coming in and seeing people still getting out to fish. So that's great. This week on the Remote No Pressure podcast, we have John Aarons, who is um, he's a local guy. He's actually from here in Michigan. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. His son and my son, they go uh, to school together. And so we went up um, to Mackinac Island for a field trip this year or last year. Just you and John? No, the Hulk school. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Me and John went on a field trip. <laughs> we came back a week later. No, um, we left the kids at home. No, but um, we we ended up going to Mackinac Island in Lake Superior State. And I think I mentioned that in a, another podcast, but um, we went up to Lake Superior State University, mm-hmm. stayed there for, for a night, and then we went and stayed on the island, on Mackinac Island. And I met John and he, you know, he's like, well, what do you do? And I was like, well, I run this fly fishing pike. I said, what? You know? And so he fly fishes and he's a counselor. So he was, awesome. yeah. So he's fascinated with, um, like a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, how it helps with, with your mental health and how yep. he uses that. And he actually helps a lot with foster kids, um, as well. So it's just great to hear him, you know, talking and we've talked about some organizations, um, on our, on our podcast, and, you know, we, we actually, um, the organization we talked about last season was the Mayfly Project, mm-hmm. which they, you know, they, they do that as well. They actually take, you know, foster kids uh, fly fishing. That's awesome. Yeah. And it really changes lives, you yeah. know. So um, he does some of that. He takes some like rock climbing and different things. He's kind of like an events coordinator. That is cool. Uh, but he also does does counseling. So it's, it's just a really cool, fascinating person to talk to. Mm-hmm. So we're super excited and very thankful that John spent some time with us. Yeah. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited to have John Aarons with me. Thanks for joining us this morning, John. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, most of the time we record our interviews late at night um, because that's after work for most people. Most people can hang out. But I mean, you got off at three o'clock in the morning this morning. Yep. And uh, came over and I really appreciate you <laughs> like, <laughs> having some coffee and uh, getting to it. But uh, what is it exactly that you do? What kind of work do you do, John? Uh, so I work at a treatment center um, down in Allegan County and I work with kids who are on probation down there um, and work with their families. And uh, a lot of the time, these are kids that are continuing to make just poor choices. And so we walk them through our program and try to teach them better ways um, of building skills and being respectful and kind of caring more about other people. We focus pretty heavily on relationships and repairing the relationships that have been harmed and um, helping them see that those are important so that they don't make the same mistakes that got them in trouble with the law in the first place. Um. Yeah, I mean that's that's it in a nutshell. A lot of the times, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm playing with teenagers, so it's <laughs> kind of fun. But yeah. now you've you've taken them rock climbing. I mean, you guys being outdoors is is part of kind of the curriculum, isn't it? Yeah, we have. Um, we we try to get them out uh, as much as we can. A lot of it's uh, in community service opportunities. But I, I I'm an avid uh, outdoorsman, and I got several staff that I work with that are into. Uh, hiking and rock climbing so we do some trips every year around that and then uh when i can get the kids out fishing then they go fishing so (laughs) (laughs) have you have you do you have any stories or do you know of anyone who's been greatly affected by the outdoors that may have been troubled in your center and found the outdoors or fly fishing um yeah i i still have 
kids Facebook me every once in a while. They're like, Hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going fishing and I'm going to this place. And, and what do you think, you know, what do you think I should use? And I, <laughs> so I got to ask him, well, what do you want to catch? And, uh, you know, I do, I do fly fishing and I've taught several kids fly fishing, but I, I, a lot of the times these kids, it's easier to, um, teach them spinning, you know, rods and reels. And, um, but yeah, I've had several kids that were like start by they catch fish and they don't even want to touch it. And, uh, by the end of the program, they're hooked and, and then they continue doing it onwards and afterwards, which I think is great. I think the more you're outside, the less you can be in trouble. So <laughs> you got, if you I got a fly know. rod in your hand, you're, you're pretty busy. You're occupied and yeah. you're not in trouble. So yeah. that's always good. Now, um, where did you, if, if you don't mind me asking I me, mean, what kind of education or wh- where did you go to school and what, what did you study exactly? Uh, so when I was in high school, I was thinking, I like ever since I was probably started middle school, I was thinking I was going to go into like wildlife management, right? And uh, so all through middle school and most of high school, you know, I got into my junior year and I'm looking at Lake Superior State as a college to go to for wildlife management and somewhere in my junior year, I just felt called into ministry. Um, and then I had some life changes. And so, uh, you know, I ended up going to a Bible college, um, thinking I was going to be a youth pastor. And when I was there, um, once I, once I started school there, that didn't seem right to me anymore. So I kind of went my first year undeclared. And then, uh, my second, my sophomore year, I, I found social work and, uh, So I ended up graduating from Kuiper College uh, with a bachelor's uh, in social work. And I was one of the first classes of them being accredited with the social work. So then I went on to my master's degree and and I got my master's in social work as well. Um, And, you know, I've kind of gone where where God's led me through that whole process. So um, I started working at a residential center called Wedgwood Christian Services in Grand Rapids. Um, towards, let's see, well, I did my internship there my senior year of uh, undergrad, and then I worked there for a few years before I went to the Cheever Treatment Center in Allegan County. So, um, And after I had my master's, then I held my limited license for the maximum number of years that I could. And uh, I did some practicing in there. I kind of, I didn't know right where, uh, I guess God had me, wanted me to be. So uh, Cheever has been great to me. It's been a place that I really enjoy working. I do enjoy working with the teenagers there and the kids on probation and their families. And, um, but I've done, uh, I've done some other outpatient uh, counseling as well. And, uh, most recently I've, uh, went and passed my, after letting my limited license lapse, uh, I went back after like a year of not having that license and I just passed the board's exam and I'm in the process right now of, uh, becoming a fully licensed, uh, master social worker. So, and I'm hoping to do in, in addition to what I do down in Allegan, I'm hoping to, uh, maybe start some, do some counseling, uh, on the side and, and start a, uh, within private practice situation. So, yeah. Well, congratulations. That's quite the achievement. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much as always for listening to our episode here on the remote, no pressure podcast. Just want to take a moment and give a big shout out to flood tide co for offering our listeners a discount code, get 25% off when you type in remote, no pressure at checkout. Also, be sure to check out our website at remotenopressure.com for some sweet decals. Everything that you purchase on our site goes back into the production of the uh, of the podcast, and we just really appreciate you guys going on there and buying those things. And also, um, leave some reviews. We all we're always looking for re- for good reviews, and and um, and if, if you have bad reviews, email us. We'd love to hear your feedback on how we can improve the show. Again, thank you so much. Be sure to check out floodtideco.com coupon code remote, no pressure at checkout to receive 25% off. Let's get back to our podcast. In all your studies, uh, your undergrad, your graduate work, um, did anyone ever talk to you about the outdoors and healing through the outdoors? Or is that a subject that's really not, um, 
uh, touched on as you went through school? Um, I don't know how much other people have brought it up to me. I know that I went through a class in, you know, in Bible college, uh, called spiritual formation, uh, and uh, with Professor Schwanda was his name. That's the perfect name. Yeah, it's, and it's a her or a he. He Schwanda. Schwanda. <laughs> That's an awesome name. And uh, you know, it, it was he was uh, he's the perfect spiritual formation uh, professor. But it was uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, kind of connected with God in all settings, kind of. Um, and in multiple different ways through that class. And I've always felt connected, more connected with God when, particularly when I'm by water. Um, I think there's just something peaceful, soothing, calming about being by water, whether it's a flowing stream or a a lake or um, it could be the fountain outside the window. But, you know, it's like anything that's that's running, it's just, uh, I don't know. Like it, it's, it's great. And so I think other people, I think I've been that, maybe been that person for other people because people, I'm now outdoors nearly as much as I'd like to be, you know, but I think <laughs> other people think I am. And right. so, you know, I'm, I'm always like that advocate for being outside and especially with the kids I work with down in Allegan they just want to sit in their basement and play video games or whatever. It's like, no, pick, pick up fishing, <laughs> pick up hunting, do something, get outside, you know, go hiking you know, do rock climbing, do get outside. Cause it's, I mean, that's God's creation. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Be yeah. There. it does. It is, it is a soothing, um, you know, it's a, it's a great thing for your mental health. I think for all people though, um, we struggle with relationships. We all want relationships. That's really the core of our being. Um, and if you trace, I think, and this comes from some of my training, I'm trained in choice theory, um, and uh, they, it's a heavy relationship-based model. Um, but I really think that even within my faith, you know, I think God's designed us to be in community, be in relationship with one another. And when we're lacking that, uh, we get really disconnected, and it's really not who we're meant to be. Um and it gets to be very lonely and depressing and people get caught in a cycle of that kind of thinking. Um, and particularly men, I think, are probably too too proud or too tough to seek help for it um, would be my guess. Uh I've done that in my own life, you know? It's like I've had an issue and rather than talk about it, it's like, oh, well. I can get through this. Sure. You know, sure, like, sure. this is, it's such a small thing. I don't need to talk to anyone about this, but then it kind of grinds on you and it just, it, it kind of eats you and, and, and wears on you day after day. And after a while, um, it, it just consumes you. Um, I always kind of liken depression to, uh, alcoholism. Um, and I've had people on both sides, like get after me about like, this is a disease, you know? And, and which is the common thinking out there right now. So I'm not trying to like step on people's toes or beliefs if that's what their therapist has been telling them. Um, but it is, you don't become an alcoholic overnight. It's not like you drank, you know, your first drink the night before. And then the next morning you wake up and you have the shakes and the tremors and, um, and you just need it, you know, it comes from a drink after drink after drink and then heavy drinking and then, you know, and, and, um, and some people that happens more quickly, uh, some people that takes a lot of time for them to, uh, develop that kind of addiction there. Um, but I think we can do the same thing with our mind and, and depression, um, where you have one negative thought and if you can't, um, move past it either in a relationship or, um, accepting that, like that, that's not true. Um, 
it can build and snowball into more negative thinking that just consumes you until you believe it. And it's all that, it's that constant stream of thought running through your head. Um, and that can be, uh, that can just be really wearing and depressing. You know, uh, it's, it's really hard to deal with and it kind of creeps up on you. So, slowly sometimes that you don't even by the time you're caught in it you're like how did i even get here Mm. um you know i think that you know and you know i said i'm certified in choice theory and and that we believe in or there's a whole model of total behavior right we're all behaving at any given point you know and we have several different pieces that go into our behavior and we have um, our, our feelings and what's going on with our bodies, but we also have our thinking and our acting. And uh, we say that the things we have more direct control over are thinking and acting. We can't really control our feelings. It's not like you can be sad and say, oh, I don't want to be sad anymore, so I'm not sad. Right, right. You know, like, and even if you did, the way that I just went about that is by thinking that, oh, I don't want to be sad, you know? And so, you know, and if you wanted to change that, then you would go out and do something that makes you happy. And so everything is influenced through your thoughts and your actions. And so if you're stuck in that negative thinking, it's about doing things that will help you lead to you to a healthier space and, uh, and thinking things that are more positive and, and lead you to a healthier thought process. Um, and within all of that, you know, like I said, we're always looking for relationships so if we um, put our energy back into doing things that strengthen our relationships, we end up being happier people. And that's really um, true and spoken of in the Bible of love your neighbor, uh, neighbor. Your navel? Love your, your navel? Your, 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 yeah, <laughs> that person, you know? That, of your neighbor, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, love your neighbor, and uh, it's just, I, I, the more people experience that, the more they find that's true. It's the people that aren't experiencing that. They get stuck in this cycle of negativity. Their relationships are falling apart. They're criticizing. They're blaming um, they're, they're threatening and punishing other people, which are all, that's a whole nother, that's all skills that <laughs> we <laughs> teach achievers. So, um, you know, that, that is very destructive to your relationships and that makes for very, very unhappy people, I think. So <clears throat> like we, we do, um, we host a trip. Well, we, we do a trip every spring and every fall. It's a trout camp where, Guys come and we go fishing for two days, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. And a, a lot of the guys come out and and just don't really do much. No no kids are there, no wives are there, and it's just that time of of building a relationship. When you think about through history, especially in Michigan, so we have this culture of deer camp. You know, yeah, the yeah. the uh, the deer widows or deer camp widows. And, it seems like these guys, um, you know, I think of old GM workers and these guys in the factories that take off, you know, one week every fall to go deer hunting and their wives, it's kind of a running joke, you know, do you think our desire to be with other guys like that, to fish, to, to be out there, um, to go fly fishing with a bunch of guys, do you think that's part of that desire for relationship? And when people leave something like that, do they feel a little more fulfilled and, and mentally? Yeah, uh, totally. I, yeah, it, it meets those those needs in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, for the guys, it's a place of you're not being judged by anyone, by your employer, or by your family. You're not you really have very few responsibilities, but to yourself. And as men, you know, you know, as we grow and our families grow and our responsibilities at work grow, we just we have more people and things taking our attention and I think it's important to take that time to reset and to have just fun. And, you know, yeah, I mean, we still want to uh, meet that need in some ways. You know, we, we all look for, um, you know, we're, we drive our behavior um, to meet certain needs. 
um, belonging to a group, to, to get love, to gain recognition. Um, but we also have uh, a desire to have some freedom and have some fun. And uh, sometimes we get so caught up in our responsibilities that we leave the freedom and fun piece out. And uh, it's really important that we're still meeting those needs. And um, I think deer camp, fly fishing camp, you know, um, those times to get out are just really important. And I think connecting with nature in particular can be just so healing and and, uh, good for the soul, good for the mind and the body. Um, so deer camp, yeah, in Michigan, it's definitely been like the <laughs> traditional and I've done a few deer camps myself that are just like, yeah, this is good. This is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I've, uh, got out and done some fly fishing days too, that I've just been like this, this was needed. Um, so yeah, it's really good. Everyone yeah, should do it. It seems like that's the first thing that kind of gets put on the back burner. You know, when you have to make a living for your family, you've got kids and soccer and, you know, all that. Like fishing is a luxury, it seems like, or being in the outdoors. And it's kind of the first thing that goes on the back burner, right? But as being more of a holistic approach, that's something that's really important to our mental health is to have that that bar. I mean, I've mentioned several times on our podcast about Stephen Covey's, you know, sharp in the saw, you know, the se- the seventh habit. Mm-hmm. And we're so quickly, we have first things first, you know, do all these, you know, all the six habits we do really great at. Right. But when we go to the seventh habit, we almost feel lazy in this culture. Like, what are you doing? Like, quit. And, yeah. You know, yeah. The, saw, the saw is sharp enough. Get to work, you know? <laughs> so I think that's important. And coming from your background, it's cool to hear your insight. Um, as far as fly fishing, I mean, what do you what do you normally fish for? What do you like to do with, with on the fly fishing part of things? Oh, boy. I'm uh, – so I consider myself a bit of a budget sportsman, uh, <laughs> you know? And uh, when I first picked up fly fishing when I was uh, in – middle school, I guess, uh, a fly fishing trip out West on, in Yellowstone. And, uh, and I got, it was contagious at that point. Um, but you know, my dad was like, Oh, this, this is a rich man sport, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he was, I mean, he was right. And it typically traditionally has been, you know, for the wealthy. Um, but I think it's made so much more affordable, now um and it's still it's still more expensive i mean i can go out there and get a spinning rod for 20 bucks where i you know it, where i can get my a decent bottom end fly rod for like 80 or 90 you know so right. um you know your starting point is a little bit higher but 80 or 90 bucks is uh you know a lot better than you know the, the several hundred dollar fly rods that used to be at or that you used to have to get you know and those still exist i mean and i'm not knocking anyone that spends a lot of money on on their equipment you know <laughs> like that's great if that's you know that's what but me for me i just i like to do a lot of different things um i love fly fishing and bow hunting uh, i think they're a lot alike because they they are more artistic in their um in in how they, uh, I can't think of the word, like uh, how they are, are played out. Um, because in fly fishing, like a lot of times you're reading the water, you have to read um, what species you're fishing for and what lines they're going to be in or eddies or riffles or um, calm pockets or, you know, like if you're fishing a stream. and um, So I like getting out uh, and fishing for trout. Um, I like getting out in the fall and fishing for salmon, um, and just fighting the logs and, and, you know, they, they zoom and it feels like the, do they even like, do they even feel that there's a fly in their mouth right now? Cause it sure doesn't <laughs> feel like it. Like this fish just ran on me a hundred yards and it's around the next bend and I don't even know where it is right now. It's like, it, it's like it's not even attached to anything here. I think I'm going to break my rod off and this fish is acting like it's not even hooked on anything, you know? So it's, I find salmon fishing a lot of fun. I'm planning on going out yet this fall and, and, uh, getting out to do that. Um, 
And I'm still waiting on that monster brown, you know. We got these monster browns I keep hearing of and seeing other people get, like, in, in Michigan. But I think the best I've ever done is maybe a 15-inch brown. So I'm like... Yeah, if I could hit that, if I could hit that twenty-inch mark, you know, on the stream, and I've seen them, you know, it's like I'm out fishing. It's like I was fishing on the Pier Marquette this uh, summer, and you had this big, I had this big one, like kept hitting uh, right near the shore on the other side of a giant log jam, and it was like, oh, well, how do you know? How am I going to get in there? <laughs> and, and you can't, you know. That's why they get so big because they're they're just so smart. So. Um, I got a lot to learn yet in the sport of fly fishing, but I do enjoy getting out and doing that. So it's kind of like golf. It's like you you you're never like an expert. You're always learning. Mm -hmm. It seems like you know. And, yeah, yeah. And that's what I like about it. It doesn't feel like. I mean, I'm five years into it. I'm not some master angler by any means, and I don't hold myself out there to be. That's part of the reason I started the podcast too, so I could pick the brains of experts. <laughs> <laughs> that's smart. That's you're, smart. You're telling me you'll talk to me. About this fly fishing thing, yeah. So I just love it, and um, but that's what it seems like. There's never you're you're always chasing for more knowledge, and you never you never have it all, you no. know. And no. it's funny because you go with people that may have only been in it for a couple of years, and they know stuff that you don't know, you know. And always being kind of an open book and learning from them. And um, is Pierre Marquette your favorite water to fish, John? Or I think so. Um, you know, for a long time, I went where it was closest. So I'd, I'd hit the Rogue up in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I really, I still enjoy fishing the Rogue. It's such a beautiful stream. Um, and there's a lot of different pockets and areas that are just really nice to fish on that, that river. Um, the Pier Marquette's a different beast. And um, that's, it's, it's beautiful up there too with all the national forest, the Manistee National Forest. And... Um, I fished the Betsy and the Manistee and the Muskegon, um, and they all, you know, they all have their different um, areas that I've fished that I've enjoyed. Um, but Pier Marquette is, it just, it's tip, I don't know, it just seems to be where I end up most of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great river, and it's it's world-renowned. So, um, so as far as uh, fishing, I mean, do you ever see yourself doing that? Um, with your kids, I know like our, we, we met on our kids field trip. Yeah. Yep. Um, last year cause our kids are in the same class, but do you see, do you see yourself teaching your son about fly fishing or has he showed any interest in that? Oh yeah. Yep. Um, so I want my kids to grow up with like a love for the outdoors. So, um, and I think my dad did a good job of that with me. Um, I I know I'm taking my kids out a lot younger than my dad took me, but, you know, I still got hooked. But I think I, I was just, I think I just have always been into it. But, uh, uh, yeah, my kids, I used to, so, like, I took my kids out goose hunting when they were, like, oh, man, they were, how old was Ezra? He was, uh, they were, like, seven and five, or maybe maybe it was even six and four and I sat them I th they might have been like younger than that because I sat them <laughs> in like one of those cl collapsible camp chairs uh -huh. and they shared a chair like they were both sitting on the same chair right <laughs> so I took them out with goose hunting and I sat them down in this chair and I throw a camel coat over them and put a little <clears throat> war paint on their face and uh they had a blast with it you know and I, those are some of my favorite pictures but Judah uh who's you know, same age as your son. Um, he, uh, yeah, he asked me all the time, you know, can we go out dad? Can we go, can we go fly fishing? And, and cause he knows that I'm into it. And I just started tying flies with both of my boys. Mm. Um, and they think that's really fun. So they, you know, they, they'll ask me with time to time, Hey dad, can we tie flies? And that's cool. Um, so I'm hoping that they get into that. Um, I'm starting them out on some simple flies and, but they've, Already, they, uh, I think they do well uh, tying for how old they are because they're like, uh, let's see, they're nine and seven right now. So, you know, I don't think there's a too young in age to start them. I haven't taken my oldest son out on the river yet because uh, um, I have to find the right water. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, typically I tr- like to travel quite a bit up and down the stream when I fish. I don't just like hop in at one spot. Right, right. And uh, oftentimes that means crossing some deeper uh, pockets. Um, and, you know, he's not as tall as I am. So right. it's a little bit more dangerous for him. Right. And so I have to find, I'm, I'm searching for that water that, uh, where I can take him out trout fishing for the first time. Um, I've done a little bit of like off just from shore, you know, or, or, and, uh, and I'm also on the lookout for a pair of youth waiters right now for him. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I do get them out, um, on the pond, which is great. Um, I, that's how I started. I fished for bluegills and bass, mm. um, from like ponds for like the first few years that I was fly fishing. Like I said, I started in middle school and there's like, I live in Zealand, Michigan, and there's no water around there. It's like, there's no lakes. You have to go like at least 25 minutes away, 20 minutes again. I mean, like you got Lake Mac in Holland and there's a few other lakes that if you travel a bit to Allegan or North that you can get to, but like in that, right in that area, there's nothing. (laughs) Which is weird for Michigan. Yeah. So (laughs) it's a lot of like ponds, you know, there's, there's these ponds all over the place. And so I, I love fishing for bluegill and bass on a fly rod. And uh, I've done that with my boys and they, they enjoy, they enjoy it. And I try to take them to a park where it's fun. I think it, especially with kids, like I set my expectations low. Like, uh, when I take them out hunting or I take them out fishing, it's kind of like when they're sick of it, we're going to go. Right. I see too many dads take the kids out (laughs) and they're like, no, we we're out here. We're going to stay, you know, until this time. Um, or we're going to, you know, uh, and they make them sit longer than the kids can really sit for or really want to. And that kind of turns them off to the sport. Like they're kids, you know, they got a shorter right. attention span. <laughs> so don't have them out as long. Um, and it, just let them enjoy it. And then when they're done, be done, you know? So that's what I do. And I, I've been deer hunting before where it's like, we get out there while it's dark, uh, you know, at, at six in the morning and um, by eight o'clock they're ready to go. And it's like, oh, you know, the deer might still be moving here for another (laughs) hour and a half, but okay. You know, so we, you know, and we get up and go then and, uh, uh, that way it stays fun, fun for them. And, and so the same with fishing, it's like, okay, well, we were only out for 15 minutes. Um, you know, but you caught a couple fish and you had fun and now you want to go play on the playground that's next door. And so, Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, John, thank you very much for spending some time with us. So if someone wanted to get hold of you, would it be okay for them to reach out? Can they find you on social media or Oh boy. I am not a big social media guy. Uh-huh. Uh, not a lot se- of se- not know, a lot of like, selfies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't have a huge online presence, you know, so it's uh th- that might be a little more difficult for me, but uh I don't know if I want to throw them If they if they would like to reach you, they can reach me and I can pass their information sure, on. Sure, right. sure. But thanks a lot for hanging out with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, John, and thank you for joining us on another episode of the Remote No Pressure Podcast. Be sure to check out our website at remotenopressure.com and also leave some reviews. We'd love to hear your feedback. And until next time, go fishing.